Amen. Ladies, would you be seated? Awesome. Well, good morning. Can we thank Jackie and Misty? Praise God for them. And really special. What a sweet time of worship. Heard harmony in the room, too. Uh, as your worship pastor, that's really uh, refreshing uh, for, my, for my heart. Uh, I had a, uh, this is not part of my notes, but uh, last night I was out with, uh, out with the guys uh, over in North Point. We had our men's, uh, one of our first men's ministry events under our new men's minister, Kevin Kowalski. And uh, what we kind of anticipated to like, man, it'd be really awesome if we got 50 men to come and have dinner, have fellowship, have worship. And we had over 140 uh, men in the room last night, many of them, uh, hopefully your husbands. Uh, but you know, uh, one thing uh, that was really special last night, and I'm thankful to see women worshiping together. Uh, I'm thankful last night to have led worship for those men. We keep the songs down really low. So we don't, my hope is built, right? Uh, and, and, but man, it was like, uh, there was like fire in the room. Uh, it was really special. Uh, and so I'm very thankful for that and thankful uh, to be here with you today. Uh, grateful for the invite from Lauren and Randy, the team. Uh, grateful to share this platform on, you know, the Tuesday, uh, oh, excuse me, Wednesday morning uh, and Tuesday evening platform with uh, awesome teachers like Chris and Rebecca. I probably come up to their knee uh, in terms of a teacher. Uh, and so I'm grateful uh, for them and for the invitation as well. Uh, before we begin, before we really get started, I want to give you just a little bit of background on me. Uh, you often see me with a guitar in front of me. Uh, and so I want to tell you about who I am, not just uh, the music side. Can we show that picture of uh, the sweet kids that, uh, and, and family? Goodness, uh, I'm thankful. The Lord has done a really incredible work in my life. Uh, I have been at, uh, at Rock Point for the last three years. My wife and I, we moved from Austin, Texas, where we spent uh, four and a half years uh, in, in my first uh, pastoral assignment. Uh, a few years before that, Leah and I met uh, in... Uh, in Memphis. We both grew up in Memphis uh, and have been together for uh, what'll be 10 years this May. Uh, we'll celebrate eight years of marriage in May, uh, which we're excited about, right? We're taking a trip. Uh, and so Leah's here in the room. Uh, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have three really special uh, kids. Uh, Ellie is our oldest. She'll be four in May. And you'll see our twins, Annie and Levi, who just celebrated their first birthday this past weekend. Uh, I've been in vocational ministry for the last 10 years uh, and leading worship in the church for the last 18 years. Uh, started off really young, really, really green, uh, and I'm really, really thankful that for the chances that people took on me uh, to be where I am today, to build me up, to equip me. Uh, I love that Jesus took so many chances on Peter. Uh, throughout my life, I've seen the Lord work uh, in uh, trial, in struggle, in failure, uh, even in joyful, you know, mountaintop seasons too. Um, uh, in one of those ways, uh, I've seen a lot of redirection in my life, uh, things that I thought I would be doing uh, to things that, uh, things that I get to do now, uh, thankfully, uh, after I graduated high school in 2009. Uh, I moved south of Nashville. Uh, I'll be 32 this summer. Thank you. Um, the, uh, I moved south of Nashville to go to uh, a school very similar to UNT, huge public university uh, south of Nashville called Middle Tennessee State University. I couldn't get into Belmont uh, for recording industry uh, in Nashville, and so I went to the state school uh, a few miles south. Uh, and so I wanted to be a, a record producer. I wanted to be in the industry. I wanted to write songs and change the world with my music. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, and so I was pretty big headed uh, at that time uh, 17, 18 years old, moving to a new city, uh, had some raw talent, but uh, not a lot of refinement yet. And uh, I was pretty puffed up. Uh, I was in a uh, auditorium style class, very similar to this room. Uh, if you've ever had a, the chance to attend one of those, it was like an intro to American media. I was like, I'm American. I'm pretty good at media. I don't have to go to this class. Uh, so I got a D in that class for, uh, based on the midterm and the final, which were on the lectures, not the book. Uh, I should have read the syllabus. So that was one of my first life redirections. Uh, I was kind of booted out of the program uh, for being big headed, right? And the Lord refined me in such a great way. Uh, in and through that. And so uh, luckily by God's um, providence, I was at um, the public university that puts out the most teachers in the state of Tennessee year over year. And they just built this new teaching college. And so I looked back over my transcript and to see what am I good at? Because uh, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've always counted on music as the thing that would be, you know, me writing music, me producing music, me living in Nashville, making a name for myself, all of those things. Lord, stirred in my heart to begin serving others. 
And so I looked at my transcript uh, and found uh, that I'd never made anything less than an A in Spanish. I took three years in high school and tested into uh, pretty high classes at, at Middle Tennessee. Uh, and so the Lord uh, stirred within my heart to use a different set of giftings uh, of, of teaching, of, uh, of equipping people uh, to do something new. Uh, and that was the Spanish language. And so I'm, I'm trained as a Spanish teacher. That's not what I do today. <laughs> and so we've got another redirection coming up. Uh, about my junior year, uh, I, was, uh, I was really, really involved on campus. I joined a Greek organization, uh, had kind of risen up through there, served as the chaplain, uh, and then the president. Uh, and we were doing just really, really cool work on campus that I'm really grateful for. That season, uh, the summer between my junior uh, and senior year, uh, my parents divorced. Uh, my dad uh, was an alcoholic. Uh, there were other, uh, there were there were also you know uh, biblical means for uh, divorce as well. Uh, you know through that, uh, and so I uh, Tennessee is a shared property state. Uh, if you're familiar with the divorce law, not that you would be for Tennessee specifically, but uh, so my parents were in the home together during the whole divorce. My dad wouldn't move out, uh, and so I moved home to be a uh, healthy, at least at the time. Uh, male presence for my younger sister uh, and to be alongside my mom to take on the burden, uh, financial burden of school upon, uh, largely upon myself. And so I started working at a lifetime fitness, uh, <laughs> uh, left a lot of the, uh, uh, left, left campus life. I was commuting from our suburb in Memphis to the University of Memphis. I transferred schools, uh, transferred majors a little bit again, uh, and, uh, and kind of transformed uh, what I was doing and what I needed to do, uh, not necessarily what I was called to do, but what I needed to do for a season in that. And so I was working at Lifetime Fitness, got a call from my old youth pastor. Her name was uh, Chris Consowitz, is Chris Consowitz. And, uh, and she invited me to come uh, intern at the Methodist church that I grew up in. My f mom would take us to church, uh, kind of starting in 2002, 2003 to church. Uh, she was a night nurse uh, at the time, working 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. at the children's hospital. Uh, in Memphis, uh, receiving you know pediatric intensive care um, uh, kids uh, that were that were hurt or sick uh, in the night over the weekends, uh, and so really difficult role. Um, end up graduating from the U of M during that time. Uh, meet Leah. Uh, we start singing together. We were friends for a year and a half, uh, and began to uh, date, pursue one another. Uh, we were married in 2015 uh, and graduated from U of M. I did not become a Spanish teacher. <laughs> Uh, felt the call to ministry, vocational ministry in my life, and uh, began working in that Methodist church, started full-time there, uh, was refining some giftings in music and worship leading, uh, and all those things. Received a call from a, a, a church in Memphis that was starting, um, bringing on a new full-time person to um, be a, a worship leader in a like, kind of a simulcast venue. Uh, like, it'd be like if we hosted a service in North Point while this service was going on that was acoustic, chapel style, uh, those kinds of things. And so I felt the Lord was moving us in that direction. It was also a good chance for Leah and I to get on the same page theologically. I grew up Methodist. Uh, she grew up Reformed Presbyterian. And so we had a little bit of this going on. Uh, we were both baptized as infants, uh, but we had some disagreements about how the Lord saved us or how we were saved. But uh, we've since uh, unified in that way. Uh, excited to talk about salvation by grace through faith in Jesus today. Fast forward a little bit, spent uh, about three years at that church in Memphis, called a pastoral ministry in, uh, in Austin shortly after we were baptized as adults, as believers in Jesus. Um, special, very special time for us. Uh, spent four and a half years in Austin and then received a call to Rock Point just three years ago. Uh, and in 2020, I finished uh, my seminary degree at Southwestern uh, here in Fort Worth. That's probably enough about me. <laughs> But I want to lay that out as foundations of my own life, stones that stack on top of each other, uh, that, you know, this, this faith house uh, that's been built in my life. Uh, I've seen sand, I've seen clay, I've seen mud, uh, but I'm thankful uh, to stand on a firm foundation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's talk about Peter. Second Peter, uh, you guys are so committed uh, to come very faithfully uh, to this Bible study and have spent time in First Peter. Um, Peter gives this address uh, right at the top uh, that he's writing this letter. Um, there is some uh, stirring uh, theory that maybe he didn't, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, you know, Peter, uh, we get a lot of different names for him. 
Peter is our English translation of the Greek word Petrus, which means rock. You'll remember that Jesus tells Peter that he is the rock, that Peter is the rock that Jesus is going to build the church on. Sometimes you'll see the word Cephas, uh, which is the Aramaic translation of rock. You'll see Simeon Peter. You'll see Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of John. Uh, He has a lot of nicknames. Uh, He has a lot of things going on, and that's due to all of the places that he's been in his life, all the places that he's done ministry, all the places that he's traveled, things that he has picked up along the way. Uh, I I resonate with that a little bit. Some of y'all know me by Austin. Some of y'all know me by the guy with the guitar. Uh, We were out trick-or-treating in our neighborhood just a few years ago, and uh, we came up on a house, and someone looked at me and looked at Leah, looked at our kids, and they said, are you? You're the, you're the guy with, yes, that's me. And so sometimes that's how I'm recognized. Friends call me AP. Friends in Nashville, we had uh, you know, several guys in our uh, Greek life organization by the name of Austin. So for a while, I just went by Powell, uh, by my last name. And so depending on where you've traveled, maybe you resonate with this too. Uh, you know, depending on where you've been, you may have a couple of different nicknames. Same for Peter. This is the Peter who was handpicked by Christ out of a life of being a fisherman to become a fisher of men. The same Peter who would be in Christ Jesus' innermost circle. The same Peter who walked on the water with Christ, the same waters that he used to fish. The same Peter who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain where Moses and Elijah appear. Ever heard of them? The same Peter who denied Jesus three times on the evening of the crucifixion. The same Peter who would be restored by the resurrected Christ and told to feed the sheep of his flock and was promised to be the foundation of the church. The same Peter who would preach, repent, and be baptized in Acts chapter 2, where 3,000 people were saved in one day. This Peter, not just a rock that the church would be built on, but a man with a ministry foundation and faith legacy that is like a mountain. Incredible. Peter sees the end of his ministry here on earth as he is writing Second Peter, as he's writing this epistle to these Christians and these small churches in modern day Turkey. The traditional theory, to the best of our knowledge, is that he wrote it. He says he does in verse one, but there's a more critical theory out there that says maybe he doesn't. That's what a lot of critical theories is. It's just saying that didn't happen, right? Or that's not right. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, you know, this letter would be written from Rome during the end of Nero, towards the end of Nero's reign, probably after the great fire of Rome. And that would lead us to aim for, you know, kind of a time of authorship between 65 and 68 AD. Uh, that, that other critical theory you know, suggests that this is a, a pseudograph by another person. Maybe it's somebody close to him. You'll remember that, uh, that first Peter, uh, Silas, Silvanus, was uh, kind of the scribe for Peter. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense because Peter was a fisherman. He wouldn't have been educated to fully you know, be able to write this out in such an eloquent, uh, learned Greek he admits to that, uh, you know, in First Peter chapter five. So, in Second Peter, we see a much simpler, less complex Greek. Uh, in our earliest manuscripts, we see that, uh, and, and and you'll remember that. Uh, here's here's another nickname. Silvanus Silas uh, wrote, uh, you know, First Peter five under the authority of Peter. It says this in 1 Peter 5 too. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. You know, there's no admission of, uh, of any scribing in 2 Peter, but we do know from Acts 4 verse 13 that our guys Peter and John were just ordinary men. It says this in Acts 4 13. When they, the Sanhedrin, they had been uh, arrested for performing miracles, preaching uh, the name of Jesus, It said this, when they stood before the Sanhedrin, they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Another affirmation of Peter's apostleship. From this, we can deduct and and give some grace uh, and credence, excuse me, to a lesser Greek. Peter has a new scope for this letter. You'll remember 1 Peter was largely a reminder to walk in that 
eternal inheritance, that living hope that's promised to us, and to be mindful as you are a Christian walking in a way of faith, walking with Christ in sync with him, that you're going to receive persecution. You'll receive uh, difficulty in this life. Uh, This is going to come from the government. This may come from family members. This may come from your spouse. This may come from trusted friends. But to stand firm in that hope. Second Peter takes a different direction. Rather than being mindful of the outside world affecting you, look out for false teachers within the church. There's this old scary movie trope uh, that uh, maybe you've uh, seen it or felt it, you know, but uh, where they pick up the phone, you know, somebody says, uh, you know, the, the call's coming from inside the house. Uh, you got to get out of there, right? This is kind of second this is the goal of Second Peter. Look out for that phone call that's coming from inside the house uh, because an enemy can rise up uh, and come to seek and kill and destroy. We want to be mindful of right doctrine and right living uh, from those uh, who we would call teachers, from those that have a following. We want to make sure that their words line up with God's word. And he's saying, before you listen to anyone else, let me tell you how it is because I was there. So let's take a look uh, in, uh, in just a moment in 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter gives this great advice of listen to me before you listen to anybody else. Let's stand with the apostles and their teaching before we go to other teachers. And this is a great hermeneutic. And that's just a big word for how we study God's word, uh, how we study the written, inerrant, infallible word of God. Peter's saying, before I go to any teacher, I know to to go direct to the source, because we know that uh, all scripture is breathed out by God. There's this great church leader and founder of the Methodist movement. I mentioned I grew up Methodist. Uh, And and you go through uh, kind of this catechism or confirmation. I'd miss that just by age of when I started going to church. Uh, But I was well informed, you know, on that just through being around and kind of catching this language and things like that. But John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, uh, incredible teacher, wonderful leader. Uh, I like, uh, I like the uh, our earliest you know, form of the Methodist church being built on systems, being built on methods. That's where we get that word, Methodist. Uh, and so being built on methods uh, and some systematic theology, uh, some structure uh, to how we read and interpret God's word. Uh, and I was taught this in you know, around 2002, 2003. Uh, and it takes a, a square. Can we put the square up on the, on the screen here? There it is. Come on. This is the Wesleyan quadrilateral. <laughs> <laughs> it, has, uh, it has four sides, four corners uh, that, that have scripture, that's God's true word, tradition, the words of the early church fathers, the words of the reformers, the different teachings and tastes of denominations of our faith. Experience, that's personal, that's you in, inputting your situation to how does this affect me with how, how does this word from God affect me in my life? As I stand here before you uh, as a 31-year-old pastor in North Texas, in my, all of my life experience, those faith foundations that I mentioned to you, how does that affect how I read the word of God? And then reason. What does my mind make of all these things? Uh, Wesley had a value of prima scriptura, Scripture first, which I think is our best practice. Um, you may see this around, uh, and this is no knock on, on Methodist or, or, or any, you know, we're non denom here at, at Rock Point. Uh, but this is not a knock on any uh, mainline denomination or anything like that. Uh, but you'll see this, you know, uh, in, in a lot of churches of where any one of these other things, tradition, personal experience, or reason, what my mind makes of this scripture without looking at context, without looking at history, things like that. Any one of these things could be the foundation. And so this is the the Wesleyan quadrilateral with scripture for Wesley in its most original form, because that's important, uh, being the most primary thing. Uh, Can I give you AP's pyramid? Let's look at the triangle here. Come on, let's build it this way. Let's put scripture on the bottom. (laughs) <laughs> Let's make sure it takes up the most space, right? This is what Peter's telling us uh, throughout, uh, and, and also what, what Paul gives us in his letters. 
let's put scripture on the bottom and have it take up the most real estate. Let's make it the foundation that we build on. And then let's look at tradition because we're pretty far away here in 2023, pretty far away from, uh, from the original context, right? And then let's let our lives' personal experience be added on top of that. Let's let the word of God, God's true word, stand on its own because it can. And then we can add that tradition to it. We can see what Wesley or Calvin or uh, uh, the early church fathers like Athanasius or Origen, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, we, can, we can go on uh, in important theologians but then we can add our own personal experience for me as a uh, coming out of a home as a young adult of, of divorce. What does, that, what does that make my marriage theology look like? Me growing up Methodist, how does that affect my salvation theology or my view of scripture? Uh, your story will be different. And then reason. After scripture, after tradition, after experience, uh, and then what does my mind make of all these things as, for me as like a sentient human being? that can look at text and can read and can interpret things, what do I make of that? And then I can put that against God's word. Is what my mind and what I know to be my own sinful nature, could I be wrong about something? Could God's word transform my heart on something that I have put my foot in the ground in a long time? So a couple of tools for you. I hope that's beneficial for you uh, as you go forward. In that, but Peter is saying in this letter across the whole thing, and this is just a preface on the book itself, uh, and you'll get great teachers moving forward that'll dive a little bit deeper into that. But let's stack it this way scripture, tradition, experience, and then reason in that order. That's my recommendation to you. Let's be cautious about uh, the other things that we may add to God's word because it can stand on its own. I've recently become fascinated by the tallest building in the world. Does anybody know what it is? Okay, I heard Taipei 101. This is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It's over half a mile tall. 2,700 feet. The, oh, it's incredible. Watch a YouTube video, because it's fun uh, to, to see just what, uh, what this building is. Uh, it has... Uh, it, it was kind of built to where you may never have to leave it if you didn't want to. You could live there, you could work there, uh, you could go to clubs, you could go to the grocery store. I don't know about any churches. But uh, if you didn't want to leave, there are outdoor venues and simulated outdoor venues uh, in there too. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is just southeast of uh, Qatar where they just had the World Cup. Uh, so we're right in the middle of the Middle East. Uh, we're at two, just over 2,700 feet tall, over half a mile and the foundation of this building, as you can imagine, is really complicated with it being that tall. There are uh, some obstacles in the way. It's right on the Persian Gulf. There are high windstorms, over 100 miles an hour, especially once you get up that tall. So the chief designer uh, had some unique foundation issues to work out. Uh, but one incredible thing uh, over the course of its 15, uh, excuse me, 12 years, that it's been fully completed. They started construction in the uh, early 2000s. It's only sunk four centimeters since it was built. Incredible foundation. Uh, and we want to make sure that that stands strong. Because a weakened structure will lead to corrosion and cracks and weakened portions that would eventually cause that half a mile tall building to completely fall over. The foundation is heavier than 100,000 elephants of this building. Just to give a little perspective, I won't go into cubic feet or anything like that, but that's something that we can at least imagine. Remarkably strong. What are you building the foundation of your faith life on? Is it as strong as 100,000 elephants? I hope it is. Peter gives us ways to explore that and to build on those things. Let's see what, uh, what Peter has to say. Let's pray. God, we love you. Lord, thank you for today. God, grateful for the opportunity to share uh, as a brother and a lot of sisters today in your true word. Uh, God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. Christ Jesus, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's dive into God's true word. It says this in 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll be reading from the ESV. This is a, a word-for-word -word, uh, translation. 
Check this out. Simeon Peter. Let's get a nickname in there and kick things off. He's cool with these guys. All right. A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ gives his own title. To those who have been attained, uh, who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Let's park there for just a second. I want to talk through his introduction and his greeting. Uh, this is being uh, written to uh, churches that, and Christians that have already received persecution. You know that from 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, it's very, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting uh, and, and very uh, appropriate that he would say, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in this tumultuous time that you stand in the, in the course of history, to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh, uh, there's already rich theology in these first two verses of a reminder of the grace that comes from Christ and Christ alone, the peace that comes from him, uh, and that he is our Lord. He is one with the Father. Let's keep moving. If you're a highlighter, please highlight verse three. His divine power, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called to us his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers in the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. Let's spend just a moment there. What's the goal? all things that pertain to life and godliness. How do we get there? Through his divine power. And that's the source. We grow in that through the knowledge of him that has called us to his own glory and excellence. Through precious and very great promises. A living hope precious promise that will never fade or perish. It says that so that we may become partakers in the divine nature uh, and pursue life and godliness. As we pursue life and godliness, it combats the sinful nature. Our desires become his desires. And in the beginning, God was so satisfied in his own glory and in his own excellence. He had no inkling to temptation uh, or to sin, and he wants to share that now with us. Kind of a breakdown if, you, if you're a big note taker. Uh, I have here in my notes the, the words, the power of God leads to a call to glory and excellence. His own power, he calls us into glory and excellence through these precious and great promises, these things that we can store up for eternity, uh, which leads to an escape from worldly desire and we can share with him and with others around us divine godliness in verse five, it says this, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And to me, these things stack together like those Russian dolls, right? Where you open one and there's another and another and another. So these stack on top of each other. These are the foundations that we'll talk about today. And virtue with knowledge, verse six, and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. The original Greek has no com commas or punctuation uh, in that phrase. And so these are one after another, all happening. It's incredible. Supplement your faith. In verse five, it says, this is a daily additive thing. You think about the, maybe the supplements uh, you take. I hear on podcasts about athletic greens <laughs> and all of those kinds of th you know, things that you can do every day to have supplements in your life. This is a daily thing that we add on top of. He starts first with this first foundation. If faith is the, the bottom, if faith is the bottom of this uh, foundation, the first thing we wanna stack on that is virtue. That's growth in moral character. The growth in your heart, which leads to knowledge, growth with your head, with your mind, 
which leads to the ability to put uh, two and two together uh, to overcome your flesh and evade sin through self-control. I love a system. I love a method. We're following one right now. God's word is amazing. Once you begin to evade sin through self-control, because you've grown in moral character, you've grown to desire the things that God wants, you've grown in the knowledge of his word and his expectation and the calling that he's placed on our lives, we can evade sin. Once we've got that, we're able to be steadfast in trial. In and out of season, remaining steadfast. Once we become more steadfast, we'll become more godly. Coming into verse seven, roll that into brotherly affection, pouring into other people around you, doing life together, serving one another. Roll that into love for your neighbors and friends, being selfless and serving like Christ. In verse eight, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where's the fruit in your life? Are they built on these things? For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. This reminded me, uh, and it reminded Leah as well, of Psalm 1. It says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or in the seat of scoffers, but whose delight is in the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, that the, this person, this man, this woman, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in its season, whose leaves do not wither, and whatever they do prospers. When we take root when we build a foundation, when those roots go deep and wide, we are like a tree by the river, a foundation that will not be moved by a storm, that will not be burdened when the fire cranks up, when conflict of life come. When I take delight in God's word and in his character and evade sin, I become more like God. I can remain strong like a tree where my roots grow deep. And if I won't, I will stop yielding fruit and will shrivel up. Uh, we know in the New Testament that faith without works is dead. Uh, and that's not necessarily a loss of salvation, but it's saying if you are not producing fruit, do you really have faith? If there are not things happening in your life, because of your faith, because you are walking in step with Jesus. What else is going on? This tree won't necessarily die, but it will still be saved by grace through faith, but that's not where our calling stops. Paul likened these types of people to spiritual infants that are mature in years, but are still very young in their faith, who maybe can't walk yet, who are still drinking milk. And there's nothing wrong with spiritual infants. We need them. <laughs> the church thrives on that. Jesus proclaims to us to go into all nations, uh, proclaiming his name, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded to the ends of the earth. But there comes teaching. Uh, and there, there's no cutoff date to being a spiritual infant, but, but at some point it's kind of weird. It's unnatural. It'd be like a 15-year-old drinking from a bottle or older, right? And it gets weirder <laughs> as you get older. There's no cutoff date, but you know it when you see it. It says this in verse 10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, buzzword, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Those roots go deep. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies, I want to encourage you to do these things in your life. Put in the hard work and live up to what Jesus is calling you to do. And it will be so obvious that you are a Christian walking in step with him that no one will question your salvation. 
Have you ever questioned someone's salvation after they've said something, after you've read something online about them? Make these things the pillars and foundations of your life, and that will never be said of you. Not even from yourself in your innermost doubts and self-talk. You can stand firm on his word and the promise that Peter gives to us. Verse 12, check our time here. We're gonna roll through this. All right, here we go. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though through them you are established in the truth that you have. I think it's right as long as I'm in this body, other translations say, while I'm in this tent, this shell, to stir you up in a way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you are able to at any time recall these things. Paul go, or excuse me, Peter goes into full coach mode, coach teacher right here. Hey, I know you know this, but I'm still here to remind you. It is my job. The Lord Jesus told me to feed the sheep, so I'm gonna make sure that you are at an all-you-can-eat buffet <laughs> until it is my time to go. He knows that his life is at an end. Uh, ending, ending the chapter uh, here, he says, for we did not know cleverly devised, uh, we did not follow, excuse me, cleverly devised myths uh, when we were made known uh, to the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Peter was there. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and his voice was born, from the, uh, born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is what they heard on the mountain of the transfiguration. This is also what we heard in Matthew chapter three when Jesus was baptized. We ourselves heard the very voice, voice born from heaven for we were with him on that holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. We saw Jesus fulfill prophecy to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place. You have kids or grandkids, it's like a nightlight. In Isaiah 9, chapter, uh, verse two, it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. To those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone, and that is the light of Christ. Until the day comes, we're back in Second Peter, until the day dawns, and the morning star, Jesus, rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I like to think about this as a musician. Uh, my first instrument was not guitar. It was actually a trombone. Uh, any previous or current orchestra brass players? Anybody? All right. Oh, I see one. Thank you. Awesome. Whew, awesome. Uh, we see, we got a few musicians in the room. But uh, so that, that's one of the places where I first learned how to uh, play instruments. And, and so for, for a trombone or really any uh, orchestral instrument that someone's putting their mouth on and, you know, blowing air through uh, or buzzing their lips, uh, there's, a, there's a mouthpiece. Uh, there is a kind of a crucial uh, thing that's happening uh, to where the musician uh, can't necessarily play the instrument uh, without it, uh, it's, and it's a little $15, you can buy them on Amazon. There's plastic ones, there's metal ones, there's gold-plated ones. I mean, you can get, you know, uh, we could get into a whole other theological discussion there, but uh, the, you know, I liken this to a musician playing an instrument with a mouthpiece. God is the musician, he is the master, he knows how to use an instrument. He is the creator, <laughs> also, of the mouthpiece, the men who were breathed into by God, by his Holy Spirit, to pen these original texts. The instrument is the word of God and the music is the gospel of Jesus Christ. These seven faith foundations, uh, these, these, these men, Peter specifically, um, were, were mouthpieces for God, carried along by the Holy Spirit. May that be the same of my life, carried along. <laughs> I can do no good on my own. These seven faith foundations, uh, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. We'll close here. Jesus spoke on the builder of a home in Matthew chapter seven. We sung about it. Christ is solid rock, I stand. No other ground. All other ground is sinking sand. He said that the, the one who hears his words and does them is like, uh, one who builds a house on the rock. Rain comes, wind blows, 
and the house still stands. The one who hears these words and does not do them is like someone who builds uh, their house on the sand. Rain came, winds blew, and the house comes crashing down with a great fall. Peter reminds us, if we implement these seven things into our life, if we pour our Christian life's work into these things, we will continue to produce fruit. We will have a firm foundation. Peter tells us that we will never fall or fail. We opened with the, can we put the Burj Khalifa back up? Oh, let's go, let's go back to the, uh, the, the, the first one. Yeah, there it is again. Are you familiar with the soil in Dubai? It's completely sand. Can we show the, uh, the one of uh, all the other buildings? This is how tall it is compared to everything else. So you'll see on the far left, the Great Pyramid in Giza, just over 100 meters, Eiffel Tower, Empire State Building, going on up to what uh, held the record for a long time, Taipei 101. And then the Burj Khalifa, half a mile tall on sand. How has it only sunk four centimeters? I'll tell you why. Megan, let's show that, uh, that foundation picture. There it is. All right, shaped like a fan with three blades. You see all that concrete? Have you ever been on the beach and tried to shove an umbrella into the ground? There's a point where you can't anymore and you have to start twisting and you know, all that stuff. Uh, if you're at a nice resort, one of, the, one of the nice guys with the drill come and you know, get down in there for you. This is how they did it. Uh, these concrete spires, I told you that the, uh, the foundation weighed uh, about 100,000 elephants. It's pretty heavy. They dug down 500 feet, still sand. No strata, no hard dirt, just weak sedimentary rock. So the chief uh, architect and structural engineer, Bill Baker, kind of a legend, it's like a Michael Jordan, Luka Doncic, John Morant. All right, I had to get a Memphis reference in there. Uh, there are 200 of these concrete spires, and they're, uh, they're about as wide as my arm's length, and they are 10 stories deep. 200 Statue of Liberties in height that stand in there. I mentioned that Dubai is also on the Persian Gulf. Underneath the sand is water. <laughs> it's incredible the way they did this. Uh, all of these crazy uh, man-made things to keep this half a mile tall building standing. Because water comes in from the Persian Gulf, it gets into this concrete and rebar and begins to corrode. How do they keep it from corroding? The foundation is completely uh, charged with electricity 24 seven to counteract the corrosion. So they use like sacrificial anodes and all kinds of cool, uh, watch a YouTube video, it's fun. So many man-made things to keep this building up. For now, it's only sunk four centimeters, less than you know, the size of your pinky nail for this building. It's incredible. I want to ask you, what man-made efforts are you staking into the ground to keep the faith foundation of your life upright? Is it putting on a brave face until no one else is around? Are you stuffing down every hard emotional feeling? Are you putting off hard conversations? Are you neglecting the deepest relationships of your life? Are you saying yes to everything, <laughs> you know, to appear successful? Are you pushing your family into every extracurricular activity so that there's no downtime, so that you don't have to be together? Are you putting your faith foundation in what you can do, man-made things versus what Christ has done? Are you seeing that corrosion and erosion are happening? Is there water coming in and now I have to electrify this to keep it from falling? Are you over-caffeinating? Is it that website that you visit at night? Are you sinking into your phone all day long? How are you charging that weakened foundation and there may be a day when the Persian Gulf rises up and quickens the erosion of the Burj Khalifa. 
There may be a day when the electricity runs out. It would take time. But there may not be a solution one day that deepens the corrosion of these foundational concrete spires and rebar. And for us, there will also be a day when all things of this world pass away. And the only thing that will remain are Jesus, what he's built, what he's bringing into the world, and what the people that have said yes to him in authentic faith with virtue and knowledge and steadfastness and self-control and godliness and brotherly affection, and most importantly, love. The eternal foundations that they have built. Because here's the thing, his divine power, the Holy Spirit that he offers us, is what should be charging our foundation. Can I invite you today to rebuild on the one and only thing that will stand when winds come? when water seeps in, when the electricity runs out, man-made electricity, our rock and cornerstone Jesus, will you stop relying on the electricity and power of this world, begin focusing on the divine power that grants us everything, access to life and godliness. Peter leaves these first century churches with, and us with these seven principles for this faith foundation. Pray that you take hold of them today. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. Thank you for today and for our time together. I'm grateful for a chance to share your word. Um, and Lord, thank you for entrusting me with it. God, I pray that as we enter into groups, may there be authentic conversation. Uh, may community be built, deeper relationships. May there be trust. God, I pray that you be glorified through our conversation, through our fellowship. Lord, we thank you for your true word. Thank you for the message and teaching of Peter today. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Hey, thank you, ladies. Grateful for y'all.